Today I would like to show you a clip from the 2011 movie called Bridesmaid. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, in a nutshell, it's the story of a 30-something uh, woman played by Kristen Wiig whose best friend is getting married and through a series of events she enters in competition with another maid of honor played by Rose Byrne. And the clip I would like to present you is a moment when the two characters meet for a moment at the tennis club and debate their mutual friends a debate if their mutual friends as change or not. So let's watch this. I didn't know you played tennis. Oh uh, yeah, I played a little in high school. I'm so glad we were able to do this. I'm really glad we could do this too. It's nice we get to hang out. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. It's too bad Lillian couldn't play with us today. Poor thing, she's so busy. Oh, I know. But, you know, she's not really that into sports. Even when we were little, she didn't like anything that was too competitive. Oh, well, she certainly enjoys playing tennis now. <laughs> it's funny how people change, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Do people really change? Mm, I think they do. Yeah, but I mean, they still stay who they are, pretty much. I think we change all the time. I think we stay the same, but grow, I guess, a little bit. I think if you're growing, then you're changing. But I mean, we're changing from who we are, which we always stay as. Not really. I don't think so. I think so. I don't. <laughs> Philosophers and inte intellectuals of all sort have debated this question for, for centuries. Can someone truly change? The same can be asked about our neighborhoods, our cities, our institutions. Is deep and profound transformation possible or are we constantly repackage the same old stories, practice or behaviors? Of course, I'm, I believe that all of us have seen reports on the news about a vacant lot filled with bottles and syringes that turn into a beautiful park or a community garden. And just a few weeks ago, a gentleman from Harvest House Ministries came to this church to talk about his uh, former life as an addict and how he's now clean and goes to school and churches to share his journey. And we love those beautiful stories. And as a church, you, we usually look for more of them. Uh, we try to discern um, how can someone be transformed, uh, why change can happen in some cases, and what are the reasons uh, behind all those little or huge miracles. We want to discover how we can be agents of change in the world. Well, according to the literature and the movies surrounding us, these transformations usually follow a fairly common plot. People who apparently have a normal existence go through a series of trials and tribulation, uh, they struggle to adapt to a new reality, to descend into a dark place, before eventually ascending to a better life. And we especially enjoy the story of underdogs who succeed despite all the odds against them because they satisfy our thirst for poetic justice. After all, what would be the point, you would say, to follow the story in which uh, the condition of an individual goes from bad to worse without the happy ever after at the end? would not be very interesting. So we love those beautiful stories, yeah? Unfortunately, our lives do not always reflect this pattern. Experience has taught us, sometimes through very painful events, that real life can be hard and brutal. Relationships and friendships are permanently broken for all the wrong reasons, 
The loss of a job does not necessarily lead to a better one. Uh, inspiring projects are sabotaged by people we trust. We do not always receive what we deserve. They complain our lodge about appearances or perception or not really important matters sometimes. For some reason, for, for no reason of their own. Some individuals are victims of discrimination, abuse, and violence. And I could continue this list of examples for, forever. The bottom line is that life is not fair. And it is completely different from the literature and the movies offered to us. And maybe this is why, maybe that most of us are tempted to look at this passage from the book of Isaiah that we have today, Isaiah 35, and look at it as another charming story, beautiful story, that has little to do with the reality we encounter every day. Because here the prophet authors a beautiful oracle of restoration in which he promises something that, once again, defies logic and common sense. It seems that the times are coming when the whole creation will be rejuvenated. Streams of waters will make the desert fertile. Flowers will bloom in parched and exhausted land. Grass and reeds will grow where the jackals used to dwell, and human life will be transformed also. The weak will find strength, the fearful will be filled with courage, eyes and ears will be opened, speechless will sing for joy, and short, in short, desolation will be no more, and God's people will never go astray. And of course, and of course, as we listen to this vision, as we read this vision, we just want to say, wow, wow, yes, please, can, can we have it, can we have it, can, can it start now? Because we're ready, we're ready to live in this place. Because as disciples of Jesus the Christ, we long for this recreation of the whole universe. We do not want only to sing, Behold, I made all things new. We want to see it. We want to live it. We want to sense it. But as much as we desire to experience this sort of transformation, it rarely happens by itself. It requires hard work, vision, and most importantly, taking some risk which is difficult for some of us because we're told to be afraid of everything, of stranger, immigrant, social media, traffic, being sued for negligence, etc. Sometimes we're so frightening to make a mistake that we almost convince ourselves that our wilderness is not that dry after all. What's the big deal if the flowers are not blooming? Maybe Maybe we should accept to live in the real world. Too often, we consider an attempt to transform our world a success only if we can, if we can tick all the boxes on our list, if it happens in the way we, we vision and the prescribed delays and can see the final product. To use an example I used a few minutes ago, if the vacant lot becomes the park or the community, let's, vacant lot becomes a garden, community garden, success. If it does not become a community gar garden as it was planned, total failure. There's nothing, it seems there's nothing in the metal. And by looking in the world in such a way, we simply inhibit ourselves. We forget what really makes us grow as human beings. We snuff our sense of hope, peace, love, and joy. We abandon our dreams of change and transformation for our world. 
writer, philosopher, and former president of Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, wrote that hope is not a conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it will turn out. So once again, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it will turn out. Profound transformation is not about necessarily what we accomplish, what we do, as much as how we are changed inside ourselves in this process. Because let's face it, everybody can build a garden. It's not that difficult. But to change our world, our country, our neighborhood, we need to reach a point when we become convinced that hard work, sacrifice, and risk are no longer an obstacle. We, must, we reach the point when we believe that we must be involved. We reach a point when we think that we have to do something because another world is possible, another world has to emerge, another world ought to be a reality for all. And when we became so convinced about this fact. We reach a point, as activist uh, Miriam Wright Edelman says, that we refuse to wait. We refuse to wait until the right time or everybody being on our side. We refuse to delay our project any longer. We come to this point that firmly convinced from inside that restoration of the land and people has to go ahead. And you will not be surprised, I'm sure, if I tell you that Advent is a perfect time to, to begin such a journey. Advent is a moment set apart for looking forward for something better than injustice, violence, and the suffering all around us. Advent is an occasion to embody this longing for connection and wholeness between all parts of creation. Advent is a season that points us to a reality bigger than ourselves. Advent is an opportunity to remember that one single life can bring profound transformation and change in the world. And because also if we cannot believe if we cannot hope that unexpected reversal, inspiration, and renewal can happen during the season of Advent, when would be a good time? When would it be possible? No. New world, new ideas, new visions are always difficult to come into vision. Yeah. And to come into realization. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure it took a great amount of courage, determination, and certain degree of boldness for the prophet Isaiah to proclaim that transformation was on the way. And even if it did not materialize in the last century exactly as we might expect it, as the people would hope for, it does not mean that this is only wishful thinking, that this is a vision completely disconnected from the real world. Restoration of the world can happen if we accept to change, if we decide to embody this reality every day and everywhere we go, because we're called to be the living proof that another world is possible and the conviction of this truth can become the driving factor of our whole existence, regardless of the perceived results. Amen.